Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait a moment to let everyone come in from the waiting room before we get started. Wonderful. I think that's everyone. Hello. My name is Rachel Lucy Hitt, and on behalf of the Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center of Florida, very pleased to welcome you here um, for another session of In My Own Words. Um, today, we're actually joined um, with the author of The Nazi's Granddaughter, um, Sylvia Foti. And before we get started, just a couple little reminders as always. Um, today's session is being recorded. So if you miss anything or want to go back and listen, you'll have access to our recordings. We'll send out a link. It'll be on our website um, and also available for you to share with others that maybe weren't able to be here today. Um, as well as just so for um, clarity so that everyone can hear, um, everyone is muted right now, but we would love, love, love to have you um, share any comments or, or ask any questions. So please make sure that you take advantage of that chat box. Um, I have some colleagues, wonderful colleagues that are gonna be monitoring the chat box today. And towards the end of the session, um, we will get to as many questions um, for Sylvia as we have time for. So with that, I'm, I'm really excited to introduce you to Sylvia Foti, who is an award-winning um, investigative journalist, uh, as well as English teacher, and has master's degrees in journalism, education, and creative nonfiction. Um, Sylvia made a deathbed promise to her mother to write a book about her famous World War II grandfather, Jonas Nareka. Sylvia had no idea that keeping this promise to her mother, her discoveries would bring her to a personal crisis, challenge her Catholic faith, unearth Holocaust denial, and expose an official cover-up by the Lithuanian government. The Nazi's granddaughter is her third book. Sylvia, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Rachel. I'm happy to be here. Welcome. Um, I see you, you have your book there. I have mine as well. Um, I have to say that I didn't know what to expect when reading your book, and I could not put it down. Honestly, it, it, uh, it was very intriguing and, and kept me going the entire time. Um, as it is a newer book, I am guessing many of the people that are joining us have not necessarily had a chance to read um, your book, which I hope they, they decide to, to get a copy after this. But can you share a little bit, um, take us back to, to, the, to the beginning a little bit. You share a bit about your family, like you, your family, and your family's legacy and what that was like for you growing up. Well, I grew up in Chicago in the 1960s uh, in a very Lithuanian community. And uh, I went to kindergarten only speaking Lithuanian, which was kind of a thing then with the Lithuanian mothers and fathers to raise their kids so that once they go to American school, they'd have a good base of the native language. So um, my mother and my grandmother always talked to me about my grandfather, Jonas Nareka, as this wonderful World War II hero uh, who fought against the communists. And I think they raised me like a lot of other uh, people my age were raised in Chicago with this sort of mission that it was our job and our duty to do all we could to help Lithuania. Uh, while it's occupied and then with the hope that if it ever gets free, uh, we need to do our part too. So um, as I was growing up, I heard a lot of stories about my grandfather, um, how he was in a KGB prison for two years, how he died in that prison, how he was executed, how his body was tossed in a mass grave, still unidentified today. Uh, for fighting against the communists and trying to lead a rebellion against them. How he was in a Nazi concentration camp for two years. Um, how he was the governor of Chaule, which is the second largest region in Lithuania. It was during the Nazi occupation 
But the version I grew up with is that he was sort of working as a double agent, you know, working for the Nazis, but doing all he could to undermine the Nazis and help the Lithuanians under his charge. And um, before that, he led, he led in, in Jamaitia, the lowlands, which is the northwestern part of Lithuania, five-day uprising against the communists in 1941. And they, Lithuania won that uprising. So that was a really big deal. Um, before that, he was a lawyer. He was a writer, kind of this Renaissance man. I always looked up to him and I always revered him. Uh, and my mom in the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s was always working on a story about her father because the community here wanted his daughter to write the definitive biography on him. So I always grew up with this book idea, this book about my grandfather in the background. And um, then in the year 2000, uh, she got very sick. She was only 60 years old and she got very sick and she was on her deathbed essentially. And I, uh, she called me to her bedside and she said, Sylvia, you have to write the book. And of course I uh, was very distressed because my mom was dying and I knew she would never give up this big project unless it was really serious. And uh, my first response was, no, 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 you're going to be fine. You're going to come out and you're going to get it done. And she said, you have to, you have to do it. Everybody expects it. So I said, yes. So that's kind of uh, how I got given this assignment. Mm -hmm. I was a journalist at the time. I was young. I was only 38 years old then. And, um, but it's taken me 20 years to get through it. But now, if I understand correctly, I don't know if you can hear me over there. Um, at the same time that, that your mother was ill, your grandmother was also ill. Is that correct in the hospital as well? Yeah, so my, my grandmother survived my mother by five months. And um, she got another heart attack. In, now it's July 2000. And I'm now I'm at her bedside as she's dying. And she says, Sylvia, how's the book? And I said, it's okay. By that point, I collected all this material from my mom, uh, mm. three bookshelves, just lots and lots of material, KGB transcripts, 3,000 pages, letters he wrote from the Stutthof concentration camp. Uh, by that point, lots of articles were written by him in independent Lithuania. Uh, the school was named after him by then. My mom had gotten this cross of Vitis, the highest honor that uh, anyone could get posthumously. So um, now I'm at my grandmother's side and she says, how's the book? And I said, it's okay. You know, I, I'm going to start it. I'm going to get it done and I'm going to, I'm going to finish it. I'm not going to let it go the way mom did. And I thought I was giving her words of assurance. Mm -hmm. And she says, don't write the book. Just let history lie. There's no reason to dig around. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know what you're saying. Of course I have to write the book. I promised mom, there's no way I'm not going to do it. And uh, she didn't like my answer. So she kind of rolled over in bed and faced the wall. And that was the end of that conversation. Um, so at the time, I had no idea why she would have said something like that. And I just assumed, you know, my mom was always sort of very stressed out about this book. It was a, it was a huge undertaking. Um, and she sort of, you know, got a lot, like a lot of anxiety and nervousness over it. And I think my grandmother was just, at that time, I thought my grandmother was just trying to give me a little pass from sure. this big project. Oh, these kind of mixed messages, but without bigger context she was you know trying to be kind and and, and give you an out right that's um, what i thought yeah and your mother had spent so much time and so much of her life gathering all of this information to write this this book um you know about your grandfather 
And then it wasn't a quick journey for you either, right? Um, from, from what I understand it, not only did you spend a lot of time in your, your research and your due diligence, um, but you got multiple degrees specifically for this project, right? You, you changed professions for this project. Can you tell us a little bit about what that journey was like um, before, before we learn a little bit about what you discovered, how did you get to that? Well, I guess I'll just tell the story of um, when I went to Lithuania in October, 2000, and then, I, and then I'll get into like how I got, mm -hmm. how I did all that. Um, in October, 2000, you know, my mom and uh, grandmother both wanted to be buried in Lithuania. And um, so my brother, who's from California, and I took them to Lithuania, their remains, and buried them, saw this famous plaque of my grandfather at this Academy of Sciences building in Vilnius, which was just put up like, like basically for our visit there. And then right after that, we were invited to visit the school named after my grandfather. And uh, it would have been his, uh, I was just thinking about this. October eighth is his birthday, so we're like one one I day off. Remember that, yeah. Yeah. So October eighth would have been his ninety year uh, birthday in two thousand. Uh, now he would be what one hundred eleven. Right. <laughs> so I'm an English teacher. So so um. And so my brother and I are visiting the school named after my grandfather, Jonas Noreko Grammar School in Shukone. And um, the kids are holding flowers and uh, just standing around and singing and, and greeting us very grandly. And you mentioned uh, it was like you were a princess, like you were being treated at the highest level and welcoming you back home, right? Because yeah, of it, your family. We felt like celebrities, you know, because of my grandfather. And there were cameras there, and you know, uh, all the teachers were standing around in the principal's office as all this was going on. And um, anyway, then the principal comes up and he says, "So I heard you're writing this book that you took this project over from your mother. Uh, that's so wonderful. Our country really needs its heroes." And uh, you're such a good daughter for doing this. And I said, thank you. And then I went into journalism mode and I said, you know, as long as I'm here, why don't you let me know how you named the school after my grandfather? I'd never really heard the story. And he says, well, you know, before we had this horrible Russian name, because Lithuania was occupied uh, until 1990, and we wanted to get rid of that as soon as we could. And so we wanted to give it a good Lithuanian patriotic name. And your grandfather was born in this town. And so uh, we decided to name the school after him. And I thought, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I thought that would be the end of the story. But um, then the director pulls me to the side and he says, but you know, I got a lot of grief over naming the school after your grandfather. Hmm. And I said, grief from who? And he looks at me as if I should have known this. And he says, from the Jews. And I said, what could the Jews possibly say about my wonderful, magnificent, legendary grandfather? Mm -hmm. And um, and again, you know, the way he said it as if I should have known to me was almost as devastating as what he said next. And he said, well, he was accused of killing Jews. And um, I was completely unprepared. It was the very, very first time I had ever heard this in my entire life. And I was completely unprepared for it. And, um, you know, I felt like I was falling through a trap door, like, like somebody punched me in the gut and he could tell I'm visibly upset. And he says, um, but don't worry, it's all in the past. It's not true. It's just communist propaganda. That comes up over and over, right? Things being talked up to just being propaganda. To this day, today. That was 20 years ago when I, 21 years ago when I heard it. And that's that's the big uh, excuse today. It's just communist propaganda. And so um, I come back to Chicago and I'm trying to forget about it. But you know, once you hear something like that, there's no way you're gonna unhear it. And so there it is stuck in my brain. 
And um, I started talking to people here, like my father and other people. And I said, have you ever heard this crazy rumor about Jonas Nareka and killing Jews? And they almost all said, yeah, we heard it. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? How come I never heard this? And they're like, uh, well, it's not true. It's just communist propaganda. Why would we ever talk about this if it's not true? So um, being a Lithuanian in Chicago, that's kind of what I believed. I, I was drinking the Kool-Aid then. And, mm -hmm. and that's what I thought. And so, um, so I, I sort of ignored it for many years and I went into denial. And this is what, one of the big reasons why the book took me so long was the psychological aspect of the story and how difficult it is if you're researching someone in your family history and you find out something like this, you could get seriously freaked out and uh, not know what to do with this information if you're trying to write a book. And um, so I went through all that. And, um, you know, I, I decided to just kind of go through all this information that my mother left. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to write the she story. She left a lot. She left a lot. She left a lot. She left a lot, and it literally took me years and years and years. The, within that 10-year period, I was re busy reading all this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, 3,000 pages of KGB transcripts is no joke. And, uh, and then, you know, I was reading the love letters he wrote to my grandmother, which, you know, were really beautiful. And uh, then I was, he wrote... On 11 of those letters from the Stutthof concentration camp, he wrote a little fairy tale from my mom at the bottom of those letters, and she was just six years old. So those those were very lovely to read, you know. And um, so, and I'm I'm trying to write the book, and I'm I'm realizing this is now I'm finally getting to your question, no and I'm realizing yeah. that um, I'm having I I am not having enough time. To do this because I was a full-time journalist working as a freelancer working for lots of different editors and publications and raising two young children and so this was kind of a little part-time thing but I was I was sensing how important the story was uh, beyond just for me and the family and you know I, I was thinking for Lithuania it would be a very important story and I'm thinking and then I'm thinking you know, it's ironic that as a journalist, I'm writing for everybody else and doing all kinds of other projects, but the project I really was like kind of born to write. And so that's where um, I decided to switch careers. And I became a high school English teacher so I could have my summers off. And um, that's what I did. So I started to finally have some, you know, 10 weeks of time, pretty much uninterrupted time to finally work on this. And that's where things started moving a little bit. But um, as I was finding more information about my grandfather, uh, which I can get to in a little bit, um, mm -hmm. I realized, and I kept sending the story out uh, to literary agents and I kept getting rejected. And I'm thinking, I'm getting very upset over, you know, because I have this good journalism degree from Northwestern University. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to I'm going to use my journalism skills to write the story. And I wanted I was trying to write it then as a third person biography. But it wasn't working and it wasn't. I had to I had to embrace being his the role of being his granddaughter dealing with this and I was sort of not embracing that at the beginning um so so that's why I got uh my third master's degree which is an MFA in creative nonfiction and they let me use this story as my thesis which was really nice and right away they said there's no way this is a straight third person objective biography. There's no way. You need to make this a memoir of your journey 
of discovery and and how you coped with coming to terms with the idea that your grandfather worked for the Nazis. And that's your story. People are going to care about that much more than they will about your grandfather. So, uh, so I learned how to write memoir. And that was kind of a, you know, most people, you know, if you're not a writer, you think writing's writing, but it's, it's like a whole other way of approaching material. And I, and some people, some people are geniuses and can do it all by themselves. I had to get the MFA to figure out how to do it. So, so um, and as you yeah, talk about uh, your research, it, it's like the story peels back like an onion, right? It was just layer after layer of um, little bits of information that drew you in and made you question more and confront more, right? Um, from, from different perspectives. Uh, can you share a little bit about what some of those little um, hints or pieces that got you questioning um, to start putting this puzzle together, but in a very different narrative than you thought it was gonna go? Yeah, so it was uh, a little before that 10 year mark where I, this was in my mom's archive this little brochure called Pakal Galva Lyatove, which translates into Raise Your Head Lithuanian. And it's written by my grandfather. And it says Kaunas, which was the capital at the time, 1933. And um, when I started reading it, I thought it was just gonna be kind of a patriotic brochure about how wonderful it is to be Lithuanian. Those Lithuanians love to say that and write about that. And um, to my shock, it was nothing like that. It was it it was uh, very anti-Semitic. This whole thirty-two pages really is very disturbing, and it talks about how he's calling for the boycott of anything Jewish in Lithuanian. So he says the Jews are foreigners. Lithuania is for Lithuania. It's not fair that these foreigners have the best positions and the best products and the most money. We need to, you know, start boycotting anything that's from from a Jew, and we only need to start buying from Lithuanians. So it's like this for 32 pages, and um, when I finished reading it, I just wanted to burn the thing, as his granddaughter. I'm and and I'm kind of like, you know, practically screaming at this, like, how how what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah. <clears throat> um. So my grandmother, I know you can't see it here, wrote up here, do the shim do you matu virukas or 22 year old young man. And it's like my grandmother's ghost appeared to me and said to me, you know what? He was just 22. He just joined the army. He didn't really, you know, everybody was anti-Semitic then, which is unfortunate, but true, pretty much. And um and you know, he's a little bit of a hothead, uh, <clears throat> but he didn't call for the killing of Jews in here. So it doesn't prove anything. So I sort of was clinging to this little phrase that my grandmother wrote and sort of building up a whole mm -hmm. scenario and rationalization over it in my head. And I was, and then I was thinking, by this point, after I read this, I said, well, I can't ignore the rumor I'm going to have to actually face it and learn more about the Nazi occupation and see what happened. And I'm going to prove my grandfather's innocent. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to exonerate him once and for all. So that was my, my little uh, plan. Well, you know what they say, what God says about best laid plans. So, um, <clears throat> so then Soon after that, um, I was hitting all the books that my mom had. I was saving kind of all the books for last because I, I, I wanted to get through all the other documents first. So this book is called Masinis Eugenius Lietuvoya, or Mass Slaughter in Lithuania. And it was uh, written in 1971. And it was a collection of Holocaust documents in Lithuania. And uh, it's categorized by city. And I look up Cholet, 
where my grandfather was the governor. And lo and behold, I find this document with his signature on it while he was the governor of the Cholet region, uh, written on August 22nd, 1941, calling up for the round, <laughs> rounding up of all Jews and half Jews in the region of Cholet. He wanted a new ghetto created for them in a little town called Jagare, which is in Northern Lithuania. He wanted all these Jews brought there within one week. His signature's on there, primary source document. And, um, you know, it didn't take me long to find out what happened to those Jews in Jagare. Within six weeks on Yom Kippur, they were slaughtered. More than 2,000. <laughs> Children, adults, uh, grandparents, everybody. And so still, this is, the excuse, though, is is carrying out, he was forced to carry out orders of the Nazis, right? That he was a victim to. Yeah. Um, you know, because I, I was a journalist, I took this document at face value as a primary source document, and, as, and I took it very, very seriously. But uh, mo many, most Lithuanians um, did exactly what you said. He was just, he was just uh, following orders. Uh, and very recently, you know, even from the Genocide Center of Lithuania, which is like the premier resource of historical information, somebody from there says, nobody knew what a ghetto was then. They thought that they were saving Jews. He thought he was saving Jews by sending them to the ghetto. He thought he was saving their life. And all of this is just a cover up because my grandfather, I mean, there, it's, it, it is possible some Lithuanian peasants, you know, out in the countryside did not know what a ghetto was. But my grandfather, as the governor of Chaule, which was the highest level of Lithuanian could be right under a Nazi, he knew. He definitely knew. Well, and this is not um, this is not the last piece of evidence, right? You you actually take quite a long um, trip to Lithuania to do extended research and firsthand interviews, um, and what appears to amass many revelations in in this story. Do you want to share just a few of those that you had along the way? Yeah, so once I finally got my MFA in creative nonfiction, and, you know, had that thesis written, my professors were very excited about it, but they're like, you're a long way from being done. You actually have to go to Lithuania. You know, you have to have grounds on the feet research um, to really advance the story. So I was a teacher, though, by then. And so it had to be in the summer because that's my time off. And so I was there for seven weeks. It was like, you know, a te practically a teacher's entire summer. And uh, so that's what I did. I spent the entire seven weeks, 24 seven, researching this, talking to a lot of people and rebuilding his life um, in Plunga and in Chole. I didn't really do Talche. I wasn't as aware of it then as I am now, but um, I did concentrate on Plunga and, and Shaolay, and the book's already 400 pages long. But um, here's what I found out. I found out that this five-day uprising in 1941, in which Lithuania, you know, won the battle against the Soviets, was in collaboration with the Nazis. And during that time, my grandfather was collaborating with the Nazis to eliminate the Jews. And uh, he helped write these pamphlets, brochures calling, you know, for the elimination of Jews. They were unsigned, but that he was part of this Lithuanian activist front. And uh, they were all by the Lithuanian activist front. And um, in Plunga, uh, he was the commandantos, the, com the commandant. He, he was the highest that, could, that it, you could be in Plunga under a Nazi. And at the time, there were only like two Nazis. Everything was done by the lo local Lithuanians, uh, quite enthusiastically, unfortunately, too, at the killing of Jews. And so um, to me, he's responsible for the death, the murder of 2,000 Jews in Plunga by uh, July 12, 13. 
And um, and then in Telche, he's responsible uh, for another uh, two to four thousand. And then in Chole, he's responsible for another two to four thousand. So um, I, it took me a long time to piece this all together. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot. There's just so much evidence, and um, it was so overwhelming. In in Chole alone, he when he was the governor of Chole during between uh, August 1941 and March 1943, he signed about a thousand documents. And most of them were just straight in Lithuanian. They were not like translations from Germans telling him what to do in these day-to-day -day operations in Lithuania. Well, 70 of those thousand are directly linked to the Holocaust, 70 of them. And most of them are not translations from German. They're just right into Lithuanian. And like, um, he's, he's responding to a request to send barbed wire to that ghetto in Jagada. The mayor in Jagada is having trouble finding barbed wire and letters. Dear Mr. Jonas Nareka, can you please do what you can to send us barbed wire and nail? You know, it's like kind, these kind of like very detailed um, correspondence that, that the German uh, commissar really would not have gotten involved in. So this was not a translation from German either. And then the other thing that, you know, Lithuanians say, this idea that he was trying to save Jews by sending them to the ghetto and he didn't know what was going on. He writes a document confiscating all the property of those Jews and, and appropriating them to specific Lithuanians. He's he Because he's such a local, he knows, well, if this Jew had, well, had a dentist, dental practice, the property of this dentist who was Jewish would really go well with a dentist who's Lithuanian. So uh, he he makes all those kind of connections and writes letters like that. And um, all of this was before they were killed. So, you know, they were killed within six weeks. These uh, This appropriation was done before that six week period. So how would he know to appropriate that mm -hmm. Jewish property if he thought they were all gonna come back safe and sound? And during this whole time, you're um, you're having to process it as a journalist as well as a descendant, right? And how how all that that impacts um, you as well as the narrative. Um, but you're also having to navigate uh, not just the documents that you were finding and and you know researching, um, but some of the people that knew your grandfather that were colleagues of your grandfather or relatives that still live there um, and trying to decipher what is truth, what is what they wish was truth, um, what is uh, forgetfulness or intentional forgetfulness, right? In, in your journey of trying to kind of sift through all of that. Yeah, one of my big sources was this Damionos Rauka who uh, worked with my grandfather uh, during the Nazi occupation in the five day uprising. My grandfather at the time was like 30 and my this Damionos Rauka was like 17, but he ended up being a messenger for my grandfather. So um, I spent a week with him in Kaunas, having him recreate the whole five day uprising for me. And he he never, you know, I kept asking about the Jews. Well, if my grandfather was in charge of the Jamaitia region, and, you know, how is it that he had nothing to do with the Jews that were killed in that region? And his response, which was common at the time, was, well, he had no idea. It was just uh, people, men under him were acting independently and killing the Jews. And he had no idea what was going on. In fact, while they were being killed in Plungia, he was in Telche or Chole. So, so, you know, he had nothing to do with it. And by that point in 2013, I was already very suspicious, but I, but I really wanted to hear his uh, point of view because he was like the last mm -hmm. living witness. He was yeah. already in his 90s in 2013 and he passed away uh, in 2015. So he's gone. Most of my sources are already gone. So if I had not done this, 
in 2013, I would not even be able to do it today. It's almost yeah. impossible to do it today to talk to somebody who was there. Um, so um, I did get kind of what I call the heroic side of my grandfather from him in as much detail as I could. But um, I had to talk to Jews to get the Holocaust side because Lithuanians were, it, this is the funny thing I learned in 2013. It's like, there's like two separate worlds. There's the Lithuanian mm -hmm. world and then there's the Jewish world. And they even, they even, they called the same place they were living in by different names. And they, I guess they were very segregated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Jews were called Litvaks. They weren't even called Lithuanians, they're Litvaks. So like all this was new to me. Uh, and I'm just kind of absorbing this and processing this and, and understanding this. And I'm, and I'm, as I'm trying to research the Nazi occupation, I'm realizing there's so little uh, information from the Lithuanians on what happened in the Nazi occupation. Now, the two Soviet occupations, there's mountains and mountains and mountains. But when it comes to the Nazi occupation, all of a sudden, Lithuanians they have amnesia. They have no idea what happened. They were innocent victims, and, and they don't know. And then I'm talking to some Lithuanians, and I'm like showing them information from Jewish sources, because the Jews were the only ones really doing some serious research about the Holocaust in Lithuania. And that, at that time, that was, and even today, it's like that. Um, I had to use that. And you, guess what the Lithuanian said when I, when I talked about this Jewish uh, information? That's just from the Jews. Well, of course they would say that. So it's like, no matter what you do, where you go, like the Lithuanians always have an answer. They always mm -hmm. have an answer. They just dismiss, dismiss, dismiss. And part of that, um, part of that seven week uh, trip to Lithuania, you you dedicated part of that time, um, was it was it Simon, am I saying that correctly? Um, who, who took you on a, a tour of Holocaust related sites and and to give you to guide you in some of that that background as a Jewish person himself who most likely whose family was um murdered by or the orders were given by your grandfather can you tell us a little bit um about not just that journey in in learning about those pieces but that interaction um because you spent a lot of time together and I can't I even imagine what that would have been like for both of you, actually. I know. He was such a wonderful man. Uh, Simon Davidovichus was the director uh, of the Sugihara Museum in Kaunas, named after a Japanese ambassador who had great risk to himself, was giving out Japanese visas left and right to Jews just so they could get out of Lithuania. And... Um, I have a friend here in Chicago um, who used to work for the Chicago Sun-Times and he's Jewish. And he, he knew me like from the nineties when I still thought my grandfather was a hero. And anyway, uh, so he kind of, we'd been talking and keeping in touch. And then right around 2012, before my trip to Lithuania, we were talking to each other and he told me that he went on a Holocaust trip in Lithuania. And in 2012, I had no idea what a Holocaust trip in Lithuania even was. I had never heard of such a thing. I'm like, what is that? And he says, well, it's where you hire a guide and he takes you to all the sites where you think your relatives are buried. It's his best guess. And I'm like, oh my God, that sounds so sad and so terrible. And he says, yeah, um, but that's what the Jews do. And it's very meaningful. So um, we hung up and then that story, you know, kind of, I kept imagining uh, my friend Howard with his family going, you know, to all these pits essentially and staring at the dirt and, you know, wondering about their relatives. And then I had an idea and I call Howard up and I said, Howard, I have a really crazy idea. What do you think if uh, I talk to your Holocaust guide and ask him to take me to all the Holocaust sites where maybe my grandfather was involved in killing Jews. And Howard's like, wow, that's a really crazy idea. 
but it's good. And um, so I, so he connects me with Simon, and Simon initially says, no way, Jose. He didn't, he didn't want to do it. It was just mm -hmm. too much for him to deal with the granddaughter of a perpetrator who may have been involved in killing his family. But then he started researching Jonas Nareka, and I get, it's a very fascinating story in so many ways. My grandfather's like so, like an uh, an archetype of Lithuania, like a really good symbol of Lithuania in one person of what happened during World War II, because he did everything and everything happened to him. Mm -hmm. And um, he's like, your grandfather's a very fascinating man. And, you know, he only died at the age of 36. So all this happened just in these short six years for him. And so Simon said, I'm going to do it. I'm like, okay. So uh, I spent a lot of, I spent at least half of my time um, in Lithuania, you know, talking with Simon on the phone and in communication or, you know, like the, the seven to 10 days actually with him 24 seven. And uh, he showed me the Holocaust in Lithuania. And I say this through Jewish eyes, because I was such a naive Lithuanian, and I think so many other Lithuanians are, were and are just as naive as I am, that you, you do need a Jewish guide to show this to you and to see it through their eyes because you're not going to get it otherwise. You just don't have the resources to get it. And so I did. I, he really kind of opened my mind and my heart to the Jewish perspective of the Holocaust in Lithuania and he was so instrumental um, in just, you know, deepening my experience and convicting me at the righteousness of this, what I'm trying to do. Um, hello? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sylvia, are you there? Hello? There we go. I think you're oh, back. Okay. Awesome. Sorry about that. So no, sorry. It's probably my fault. My my Wi-Fi is acting funny here today. So um, so anyway, Simon was very instrumental instrumental to me in convicting me of, of the righteousness of this mission. I was at this point, I was really thinking it was like a mission, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I just loved him. I mean, we really became very good friends. Uh, and we became very close to each other, despite the strangeness of our backgrounds. You know, like the granddaughter of a perpetrator um, connecting and collaborating uh, mm -hmm. for the truth of uh, what happened during the Nazi occupation. So it was a whole wonderful collaboration this time uh, between a Lithuanian and a Jew in figuring out what happened during the Nazi occupation. And so, um, so I, there's a lot of chapters in my book about mm -hmm. being with him. And I would say that this is one of, you know, the big things about my book, at least, and, and in my mind, is that it, for the first time in, in Lithuanian history, it connects the Jewish experience and the Lithuanian experience of what happened in World War II. Because before that, the Jewish experience was only in Jewish sources, and the Lithuanian experience was only Lithuanian sources. And this is one of the first time that both are kind of put together in a single narrative to kind mm -hmm. of show the big picture uh, through my eyes and my consciousness in a first person memoir yeah. with a lot of emotion to it. And like you said there, um, that Jews were the ones that were trying to tell the story at, in, in its factual right, how, how it really happened, um, although they were not necessarily given the same, um, they were not believed, right? As you said, they were kind of, kind of just brushed off that like, of course, they're going to have a certain perspective. Um, part of it is it, it wrapped in this propaganda um, and everything was kind of just brushed under the rug and um, the narrative that you were raised with is what took the spotlight, at least in, um, communities that you were in, right, that, that you saw. Um, but through your research and, and this journey and um, meeting all of these people and understanding from different perspectives and 
um, when when you all when you read this book, um, you know Silva really, uh, I think, shares part of her heart in in what she was experiencing during that time and what it was like to actually be in um, some of these really horrific places that uh, that had connection for both you and Sam, right? Um, but the thing is, you've used this uh, not just to tell a more accurate story of your family, um, but to have a more truthful narrative for Lithuania as a whole. Um, and time and time again, um, what I've seen at least is that you were trying to use your research to, to prove to Lithuanians and to the government um, and to say, we have to be honest about this now. Um, the evidence is all here. And you were met with a lot of pushback in that. Where does that stand now? There's still a lot of negativity among Lithuanians about this. I sort of, you know, because <clears throat> it took me almost 10 years to get over my denial. They're only like in their first or second year of uh, at least encountering my, my version and my story of it. And my story has brought a lot of inter international attention to this to Lithuania, and it doesn't make Lithuania look good. And uh, so they're calling me a KGB agent and a traitor to the country. And then now that the book's out in English, and some of them have read it, they're they're completely discounting me. They're like, "You're not a, you're not even a historian. You know, you're not even a PhD. And how dare you!" pretend that you know what you're doing. Uh, if if you weren't his granddaughter, nobody would even care. Like, duh, that's exactly why the story's getting so much traction is precisely because I'm the granddaughter. That is the story. Mm -hmm. and but you've also had prominent Holocaust historians read the book and fact check and and comment on, on it and, and support it. So that is backing as well. I know, but Lithuanians discount that. Yeah. That it doesn't mean anything, because uh, some of the historians are Jewish. So what else would they say? You know, like like Lithuanians are amazing at this. <laughs> They're not the only ones. The other Eastern European countries are like this, but you know, other Eastern Eastern European countries didn't have a granddaughter like me talk about their grandfather yet. <laughs> well, you know, I um I, I do want to make sure that we have some time for questions from the audience, but. I really wanted um, to know a little bit about, there's something that you say um, in the book, you know, oftentimes with uh, children or grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, um, there is now becoming more discussion of intergenerational trauma, right? And how that has impacted the family. Um, but you specifically mention um, uh, multi-generational costs right, and, and how this has impacted the descendants of a, a perpetrator. And I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit as to what your experience had been, um, has been, and probably will continue to be for you as well as your family. I think um, because in my, I think my grandmother knew what her husband did, what my grandfather did, as far as Jews in Lithuania. Um, and I think because she kept it a secret that when you hold a secret that big in, it uh, the pain of it hits other members of the family in a way that they don't even know what they're dealing with. Um, in my grandmother's case, she was very critical and severe. And, uh, and maybe the secret had something to do with all that. And she sort of had a, a sad life here in Chicago. She uh, was alone, you know, and couldn't really master the English language and, you know, kind of was too dependent on my mom in some ways. So the boundaries were funny between them. And, um, and I didn't even put all this together until I was finally researching this book and thinking about it, like from this uh, deep psychological aspect and in my own life, in my own personal life, um, you know, it was kind of traumatic in, in my home too, because I was spending so much time 
trying to wrap my head around what was happening that I, maybe I wasn't available to my own family members the way I could have been because this was just so overwhelming. It was just so overwhelming. And um, I can't believe I'm tearing up, but um, it's, it's a trauma. It's a trauma to find this and to discover this. And uh, it's overwhelming. And it takes a lot of, I don't know, uh, stamina, I guess, and perseverance um, to wrap your head around what happened. And it's not just my family story, it's all of Lithuania. And if it were just only my family, it would be one thing, but it's like, it's all of Lithuania and there, it's, it's where all of us are gonna be going through this if we face this. I, I hope you don't mind that there was a, a quote from the book. Um, when you're at one of the, um, I, I don't even know if it's a memorial at this point, but one of the sites right, that, that you experienced there, you said, this is where my grandfather set the Jews, I told myself. 2,236 bodies lie buried in the unmarked grave. I contemplated that number. Standing there, soaked to the skin, despite my umbrella, I endeavored to pray. I have no words. I do not know what to say, but I have come. Is it enough to bear witness? What else can I do? I cannot undo the past or redress my grandfather's action, but I am willing to face what was done. I am sorry, so sorry for the unimaginable loss. There's so much there, right? Um, and I think just doing uh, this, not just for your family, right, but but for the world and for truth and for accurate history um, is doing quite a bit, right, doing quite a bit. Um, and I have seen in the chat, there have been some questions that have come up, and I want to honor them and, and be able to at least get to a, a few of those. Um, and Lisa, I know you've been, Lisa Bachman, you've been looking at some of those. Would you be able to, to share some of the questions that were coming through? Yes, absolutely. Happy to help. Um, Sylvia, first of all, I have to say thank you for your vulnerability and for the realness that you have brought to this discussion. The um, Several times I've teared up myself. I got chills while Rachel was reading that quote. So thank you for your bravery in taking on this journey. We do have a number of questions. Some of them were answered a little bit. So I'm going to try to get to the ones that weren't. Um, Holly wanted to know if the name of the school that was named after your grandfather was changed. Is no, that not still, yet. It's, it's still it's, that it's, name? As far as I know, my grandfather's still a hero. He's still officially a hero there. It, that plaque is up there. The school is there. The cross of Vitus is still, uh, you know, considered something that he earns. There's still, it, this is not over. This is going to take a long time. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, another question that was brought up, and I, I think you kind of answered this, but I'm going to mention it just because the question was specifically brought up. It, it asks, did you know, do you know if your grandmother directly knew and if your mother knew about what your grandfather was doing? Yeah, I've given this a lot of thought, as you can imagine. Uh, my mom was only two years old at the time in 1941, so she wouldn't have known directly. My grandmother knew. I'm sh I'm convinced at this point that my grandmother knew. Uh, you know, I reveal in the book that the family lived in uh, a house in Plunge that was taken over by a former Jew, which was right next to the synagogue, which was used as the ghetto, to house a lot of those thousands of Jews that were eventually killed under my grandfather's orders. So when I put, you know, when you put it all together like that, um, I think I'm almost, con you know, I am. I am convinced my grandmother knew. I think my mom had heard the rumors, which she would have just considered a rumor. And I think she just went into denial. And that was as far as she went. And I'm also beginning to think that my grandmother was sabotaging 
the story for my mother to write. And that's one of the reasons why it took my mother so long to do. And, you know, both my mother and grandmother had died before I seriously got into it and before I even made this discovery. And I think, I mean, as painful as it was for me to lose them, I would not have been able to write the story if they were alive. There's, I, there's no way they would have stopped me from it. Yeah. Got it. I think we've got time for one more question. And um, one of the questions posed was, what is the biggest thing that you've learned from this process? Human nature has no limit to its depravity. And also human nature has no limit to its goodness. You know, that actually goes right along with, I, cause I had, um, I had similarly had a question like that, but I wanted to ask that, you know, being a teacher, and I know that you've spent time in putting together some curriculum to be used um, along with this book um, as to, to what you want students to take away from this. And I wonder if it's, it's the same as what you learned on this journey or if it's slightly different. Um, I, do, I do have lesson plans on my website for social studies teachers and English teachers. Um, for social studies teachers, it's specifically uh, kind of lesson plans on Holocaust distortion and denial and how that works uh, through the life of uh, what is happening in Lithuania about my grandfather. And I've got all kinds of source documents that teachers could use with their students. Um, the English teachers, you know, kind of do would go into like deep questions like this, I think. Um, and so I have discussion questions, guided discussion questions. And so I think uh, by looking at the uh, discussion questions that I put together, they're, they point to questions, you know, answers like this that I just gave. Thank you so much. And um, we'll be including this all in the follow-up email as well, but this is on your website, right? SylviaFody.com, where the curriculum is up there. If there's any teachers out there that would like to view it, um, as well as to be able to, to purchase your book um, or learn more about you. So thank you so much, Sylvia. Is there anything, um, I have a few uh, concluding notes that I, I wanted to share with everyone, but is there anything else that you wanted to, to share about you or your story or that you want people to know? Just thank you for listening. Um... You know, the true heroes in Lithuania were the Jews who were killed just by virtue of being Jewish, and that's it. And um, I wish Lithuania would stop making my grandfather the hero and, and look at the, vic the true victims of what happened. So maybe that's my last remark. Thank you. Um, and for everyone out there, as much as was shared here today, I guarantee you there is so much more information and pieces of the puzzle um, that I think you would find interesting and um, very important to know. Um, so again, that's the Nazi's granddaughter um, at, at sylviafodi.com. Um, thank you all for, for being here today. As I mentioned, we have recorded this. We are going to be putting it on our website later today. Please forward it to anyone that wasn't able to be here today. Um, you'll be getting that in the email as well as um, a link to her website. Um, and very exciting that uh, now that our, our museum is open, we also have a new exhibit up that has been curated in-house. Um, it's called Uprooting Prejudice Conversations for Change. And so I really want to um, invite anyone that's able, that's local and able to come out. This particular one, it's centers the perspective of um, Daryl Davis, a black musician and ally who has dedicated his life to fighting white supremacy um, by de-radicalization and you know, fighting uh, white supremacy through really creating um, conversation, dialogue, um, creating friendships with some of the most 
unlikely people. Um, and some of those were former members of the Ku Klux Klan. And it, and it tells this, this story um, of coming together and uh, really fighting white supremacy. Um, our grand opening actually to the public is October 15th. And I'd like to invite anyone who's able, it's from 1 to 3 p.m. And we're very lucky that Daryl is actually flying in um, to be here for that. So you'll not only be able to see the exhibit, but also meet Daryl in person. Um, other than that, we actually, the last thing I want to invite you all to um, is to join our team as we celebrate um, Unity Day. Um, and raise awareness and funds to help support our educational programs like this and others. Um, over the course of the week, and this is October 18th through the 22nd, we are hosting a myriad of, of uh, fun activities around the city, around Central Florida. Um, everything from taking a dance class to uh, working up a sweat at Orange Theory Fitness, um, making your own chocolate or creating your own photo shoot all in a way to raise money to help support programs like this. So if you're interested, a link is being put into the chat to register for that. Um, and you can find all this information also on our website. So again, thank you all for coming, Sylvia. It was an absolute pleasure to, um, to meet you, to hear your story and to read your book. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.